aligned with World Engineering Day 2023 theme, Engineering Innovation for a More Resilient World. And as part of the celebrations of the web, the Young Engineers Future Leaders Committee is organizing today this webinar titled Smart Sustainable Communities and Frontier Technologies in collaboration with FedEx, UITP, and SPEED. Frontier technologies have enabled cities to remain the way they manage urban complexities and infrastructure, from enhancing cities' responsiveness, optimizing energy efficiency, to improving access to public services. With the proper guidance, Frontier technologies can make cities smarter and more sustainable and provide the opportunity for leapfrogging, accelerating global process towards the new urban agenda and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I would like to thank our speakers for joining today and for all the input and the time and the efforts they've done to contribute to this webinar. Let's start immediately with the opening remarks by the World Federation of Engineering Organizations President, Professor Jose Vieira, who, have, who has become the president of WFEO at the General Assembly in Costa Rica in March 2022. And Professor Vieira was the president of the European Federation of National Engineering Associations, FIANI, from 2014 to 2020. He has contributed to enhance the visibility and the value of engineers in the society by stressing on the importance of promoting the UN Sustainable Development Goals in future engineering education and practice. Dr. Viara, you're welcomed. Thank you, Firas. Um, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Nelson Ogunshakin, Mohamed Mezgani, Kien uh, Gunalan, Marlene Kanga, Fadi Shaya, and Hayal Patan. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, and welcome to this very interesting uh, webinar on smart sustainable communities and frontier technologies. As introduced by uh, Firas uh, Bodia, Chair of WFO Young Engineers Future Leaders Committee, I am the president of WFO, the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, the International Organization for the Engineering Profession, and uh, I am very pleased to deliver this short opening address. It gives me great pleasure to open this important event whose focus is centered on the threat posed by new realities that will characterize human development in the coming years. On one hand, the intense process of urbanization of the world's uh, population, and uh, the, uh, on the other, the dissemination of information and communications technology that will be available to people at uh, every level of society. First of all, I would like to congratulate the WFO Young Engineers Future Leaders Committee, in particular its chair, engineer Firas Bodia, for uh, holding this webinar. I am, I am particularly happy to see that this event represents WFO's effective commitment to actively building a recognizing affirmation in the discussion and search for solutions to global society challenges dealing with imminently cross-cutting issues through the specific vision and approach of distinguished uh, experts. I also want to highlight the fact that this webinar is part of the celebrations of the World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development proclaimed by UNESCO at its 40th General Conference in 2019. This day offers an opportunity to highlight engineers and engineering activi uh, activities and achievements in our modern world and improve public understanding how engineering and technology are central to modern life and for sustainable development. Due to the technological democratization of society, dramatic changes in social life have been resisted, transforming modern civilization on a more individual level. Personal computers, mobile communication devices, robots, and some 
are other uh, some examples of the future of this uh, recent past. The new possibilities offered by ICT improve and modify traditional urban services, optimizing the design for internal transportation networks and the information and telecommunication services. We already have many daily examples of this. A screen or our smartphone tell us when a city bus will reach us via WhatsApp, we can send or our complaint about some furniture that's been left in the street, note its exact location and provide a photo. The water, light and gas companies can read what we have consumed via, via smart metering and so on. On the other hand, climate change and its consequences are critical issues and challenges that the international community is facing due to overlapping crises of water, food and energy with very significant negative impacts on socioeconomic development and people's well-being. When we address those threats and challenges, we realize the overwhelming and the ubiquitous involvement of engineering and engineers. This is why the theme of this year World Engineering Day is set as engineering innovation for a more resilient world. Its main message is to leave an opportunity to celebrate engineering and the contribution of the innovative and the responsible work of engineers to a better and sustainable world. I am also sure that uh, by combining the forces and knowledge of the global engineering and scientific community, it will be possible to find solutions and measures for scaling up and improving infrastructure for poverty reduction and facing the challenges of global warming and climate change, both in developing countries and mainly in developing countries where the vulnerability of infrastructure and societies is more evident. In this event, we'll have the pleasure and opportunity to hear distinguished speakers from different professional backgrounds and with different approaches on, I, say, I quote, making 15 minute cities a reality, challenges facing, faced by urban mobility and how public transport can contribute to the sustainable development of our cities, striving for smart, sustainable and resilient communities, frontiers technologies for resilient and sustainable cities, examples of successful implementation, the fuzzier frontiers of technology and smart city, efficient transportation, infrastructure, and energy, fostering engineers for tomorrow. This webinar promises to be informative and exciting, and I am sure that it will be a success and will have the impact that is advocated for a greater and increasingly influential of WFU in helping the achievements of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Once again, I want to acknowledge the invaluable dedication of FIRAS Boudouillard in designing and moderating this webinar. And my gratitude extends to everyone that has made it possible. I wish all of you a fruitful webinar. And now I give the floor to FIRAS for moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jose. Thank you for your uh, time and for the opening remarks. And now uh, <clears throat> we'll start immediately with the prominent speakers and we'll start with Dr. Nelson. Dr. Nelson has been the FEDEC chief executive since July, 2018. He has more than 30 years experience in planning, finance, delivery, and management of major property and infrastructure investment projects. He has an overall responsibility for FedEx global operations. Dr. Nelson, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Firas, and thank you for the opportunity given to me to uh, join you and the eminent uh, panelists this uh, particular morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are, in terms of the activities. Uh, I'm so delighted that uh, Marlin continue to engage FIDIC uh, on this wonderful and fantastic role that, you know, Firas and his colleagues are doing. 
let me first of all acknowledge uh, the particular you know, opening remark by Jose Virea, uh, which is absolutely profound in terms of the role of the future leader of the World Imperium. I think he's been brilliant to actually see that the youth are taking the lead. I, I hope you know, that uh, this be something that we can engage with in the future uh, and move on. So thank you very much. You've given me 15 minutes, I believe, to uh, present. I hope you can actually see my slide. Is the slide visible? Right. So I'm just going to move on in terms of the slide. Let's hope we can get it to work um, in terms of activity. Now, I I thought, you know, from the opening remark, you know, of course, we come from different backgrounds. I think it's important that we just give a very quick flavor of the FIDIC footprint and representation. As you see from slide, we represent over 100 countries. Uh, with over 40,000 consulting professional firms, firm, not you know, individual, and really the footprint in terms of our economic range is over 19 trillion in terms of the activity that we support. Uh, we do have a structure which is global, even though I'm based in Geneva, and you can see that we also have regional dimension, which if the uh, organization that we are working with are interested, we would like to collaborate. But below that, really, we represent companies and individuals uh, in the world of diversity and inclusion, I made it a responsibility when I came into FIDIC that the FIDIC need to reflect the society so you can see in terms of our governing structure that we truly represent the globe. Uh, our objective is very critical. One of the areas about stimulating development of talent, skill, future leader for the consulting industry to which I believe the World Engineering Forum is also part of that. So I'm really uh, glad that you know, we're having this sort of partnership. Now, we cannot talk about sustainability or smart, you know, sustainable, you know, city or frontier technology by ignoring the political landscape. It is what it is. There are challenges in the world, and you can see from the issue about urbanization, more and more people want to live in the city against the backdrop of, you know, 15 million from the city. But within that, we have the challenge of COVID. We have issue of war that is happening in Ukraine. All of this is asking engineers about what society do we need to work in? And not only do we talk about you know, how cities are going to behave, you have the big issue of the you know, COP27, COP28 coming up. And so there is a big issue that we need to address and the subject is very relevant. But actually it's also interesting to look back to say there is a huge demand for infrastructure. And as we go for the infrastructure development, we need to understand there's a huge shortage. And if we are to fill the gap, it means that most country will need to spend 3% of their GDP on investment in infrastructure. But it's not just any infrastructure, it's about sustainable infrastructure, it's about how cities is going to operate within that dimension. Within FIDIC, all that we do is very much frame along the G20, or is see the quality infrastructure agenda. So we look at these six principles and we look at the issue about strength in infrastructure governance. One of the areas that come out of that is the issue about, you know, AFC and all the issues that we talk about within FIDI fit into different parts of the, you know, G20 OECD quality infrastructure. But then if you focus straight on the point that you talked about, um, the sustainable city was described in the past that range from issue about smart transport to smart homes. And this is fact. And in between that, you can go across the issue to a smart office, smart energy, minimum waste. And in between that, there are numbers of other issues that we need to talk about, about sustainable city. That was what it is. But if you then look at, you know, the things that improve the environment that we talked about, you see that transport is very critical. Sustainability is big, smart office, living building, green space, smart water, smart energy, and the list goes on, including smart home. The question for us is, you know, how does that fit into the topic? So cities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In my opening remark, I talk about there is a trend that more and more people want to live in the city. Is that the safe? Is that the right way to go? And as the small city become bigger and bigger, they become more of urbanized area. So this is a challenge that as city grow, the problem around transport, community, and so social cohesion become more visible. I think the traditional approach is really you look at the city sphere of influence and reach. And you know, whether you look at a big city, you look at all the small city within it, and you ask, you know, where is the sphere and how far does it go? 
And really, how far do you push that in terms of how cities should behave? There's a traditional view that everything has to be in the city. More and more people want to live in the city. But the question is, how does that fit in in terms of despair for transport, for green space, remote working? Now, you know, not only does city and communities fare, you know, people fare chain, what we've seen as a result of COVID is that more and more people are working from home. So the question is, how do we define the issue about smart city and where the smart sustainability city and frontier technology come into that? So my thought on the issue about 15 minute city is, it is widely acknowledged that we cannot continue to build the way we have been. That's fact, we have to change. So our city have largely been designed on the post-war principle of being living in the suburb and community. But I think over 70 years, we've seen major change, urbanization and densification, and then gridlock things that comes into that. If I talk about where I am today, which is really speaking to you from Geneva, population there in the evening is about 500,000. And then, you know, sorry, in the evening, about, you know, you get 500,000. And during the day, you got 750,000. So we have night migration, of 50% of people from different parts coming into that. The question you have is that, you know, can we have 15 minute city, you know, created? And the pandemic is actually encouraged more and more people to work from home, which means you need to have local shop, you know, have city you know, opportunities. So we put something on, on our program about where we come about, you know, COVID and the shift. I think we've seen that COVID has actually shaped the way community want to behave. The 15 minutes is now residual, you know, urban concept, most daily necessity and service, such as workshop in education, health, leisure, should be located within 15 minutes walk. That is the whole idea. If I flick back into other road that I have, which is a board of, you know, uh, Transport for London in the city, we are spending more and more time to create, you know, what I call super urban highway for bicycle so that people can walk to work or ride to work and make the essential that is required that's happening. So you can see urbanization is still a trend, but at the same time, people are more and more moving to the idea that COVID has changed the last scale. So the challenge we have is that people are now questioning, is the assumption that we had before still right in terms of sustainability, or do we need to shift? So the question of hub and spoke is one of the models that people talked about. I, we have a big city, or we have a suburban city where people can congregate. The question is, this is an airline hub and spoke strategy. Does it work in the new world or do we need to find a better way to actually operate in the future? This is the challenge for us and for an industry and for engineers. So you talk about that, what happens if one of your suburbs become disconnected? Does that mean the community itself can become fully disconnected from the urban sports idea? Should we be looking for a new connectivity, a multi-communion model that connects all the pop together in such a way they are interacting with each other? And regardless of what happened in between, you still have a greater resilience within 15 minutes. I hear uh, the president uh, actually advocating that, you know, the idea now that we need to make sure our society are more resilient in terms of how we see issue happening. Not only do we hear earlier on in the conversation with my fellow speaker that we have some part of the United States which potentially being cut off because of snow. What happens if those particular areas are depending on the big city and they don't have the connectivity and be able to have the resilience? So this is the challenge, but how do we use technology to make sure technology help us uh, to address the issue? Mr. President spoke eloquently about you can have your mobile phone in your mobile phone, you can do majority of things. Whether you want to connect with your friend or speak to anybody around the world, you can even connect, control your smart city, your electricity stop at home, your mobile phone, your system. You can control everything about smart building. So I'm getting to the point where with the technology that we have now, we really have you know issue about moving from the COVID into a new world. I call it the new normal where you can control your electricity, you control your energy consumption right from your handset for your mobile phone. And that creates a new challenge for us, an opportunity for the engineering field. So we've addressed this issue by looking at our, you know, state of the world report, which we published last year, and we're looking at building sustainable community in a post-COVID world. In there, we looked at a number of issues. Some of the pictures that I've shown earlier on today, they are available in that particular, you know, with state of the world report. And you are welcome to download that. It is available free of charge. But the beauty about this is we start to question with the COVID and post-COVID and the technology and the drive for people to live in the city, how is this going to change our transportation? 
How is it going to change our port and aviation? How is it going to impact the aviation and the market that we operate in? All of that, in my mind, I see challenge opportunity for engineering profession to address. So my take on it is the topic of smart, sustainable cities here. Uh, you look at frontier technology, we're looking at how technology can be used in a way that can solve the problem, but we do have opportunity to resolve. And I do believe that engineers have a role to play, whether in a building facility or issue to do with just pure infrastructure. Either way, my definition of the infrastructure is always looking at two modes. There is the soft infrastructure and there's the hard infrastructure. The domestic, the commercial one are the soft one, but the hard one are the aviation and the maritime. Collectively, I do believe that engineers have a role to play and it couldn't have been better things to do that the World Engineering Day is celebrated and that the future leaders are taking a lead role. Uh, Firas, I'm congratulating you and your team for taking this initiative, for having fantastic speaker to lead this conversation. And I'm going to rest my presentation at this point by saying thank you very much for the opportunity to share my thought on the subject. And I'm going to listen to the rest of the speaker before I disappear. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nelson, for your valuable input and time uh, and your uh, time for this presentation. It's really appreciated and we're always looking forward for future contribution and coordination with FedEx on different activities. Now, uh, we'll go to uh, Dr. Guna. Dr. Guna holds a PhD in civil engineering from Texas Tech University and he's currently a senior vice president at ACOM. He has also successfully delivered multi-billion dollar program and projects, and he has been active in various professional societies uh, where he has been like the 2020 president of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Dr. Guna, you're welcome. Thank you, Firas. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, as, uh, as a representative of the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is an affiliate member of WFEO, the great organization, the global platform for all engineering. I'm glad to be here. And I'm also here, you know, as a representative of WFEO as a chair of the UN Relations Committee. So there's a lot of conversations going on at a lot of different levels about the current and the future of our time here on this planet that we have come to call home. And I'm glad Firaz and the Young Engineers and Future Leaders group of ASC, of ASCE and WFO and other organizations is in good hands, thinking about not only today, but of tomorrow as well, in terms of how do we maintain the quality of life and preserve the resources on this planet for the future. ASCE embarked on a project for what is called as the Future World Vision. And if you go to www.futureworldvision.org, it'll give you an idea in terms of what life could be 40, 50, 60 years from now. So as Dr. Nelson pointed out, you know, we are looking at it as from a research perspective to look to see what life would be, what do we do to prepare the engineer of tomorrow today? You know, there are five concepts that have emerged. You know, one we know that we already are experiencing that called the mega city concept. Then we have what is called as a rural city. And I think Dr. Nelson eloquently called it the hub and spoke type of a, an arrangement. And then we have the floating city, the frozen city, and cities on other planets. The underlying issue here is how do we improve the quality of life? And I think as President Jose Vera pointed out, we also need to not only look, you know, look behind to look forward. So we need to look at where we are today. The earth work we're going to have about 9 billion people, 9 to 10 billion people on this planet pretty soon. And we talk about frontier technologies, at least my understanding with interactions with esteemed colleagues at the UN and other places, and including WFEO, is that almost 2 billion of these people don't even know what it means, don't have access 
to what we all are now. We are coming to you via Zoom. A lot of people don't have the tools and the technology to even access to be able to communicate. You know, human beings are gregarious, like to communicate no matter what and how isolated we get. Even if, you know, the pandemic was an example when it tried to cripple the economy and everything else, we somehow managed to be innovative and creative to be able to connect with each other remotely, even though we were sitting in the comforts of our home. So we need to look to see what is in, in the future, what do we have and what do we know today? I use uh, a, an analogy of a colleague of mine who's an ardent surfer, and we always use the waves behind us, you know, to take us to the shore of a promised land, of a quality of life. And I think Nelson also eloquently pointed out, in addition to looking for new things, we also need to think about conservation. You know, he talked about trying to preserve energy and sources. So that is another thing that as engineers, we need to, to be thinking about is, what do we do in addition to building new facilities and you know, I'm trying to change the vocabulary a little bit, and I'm glad Firaz uh, took the advice. And we not only call it smart, calling it smart cities, which only makes to you know let you know that the rest of the country is not so smart, but human beings live in communities. So whether you live in an urban community or whether you live in a rural community, every community needs to be smart. And we go by the UN's concept of leaving no one behind. So whether you're in an urban setting or in a rural setting, you should have the same resources and ability to have a quality of life that you choose to have. So we also need to change the thing about not only transportation, I use the word mobility, whether it's a mobility of goods, services, people or whatever, we need to make sure that we provide access. And I think it's a 15 minute city, cities, we now in the urban setting call it the last mile. You know, we are trying to use the, you know, the public sector, the transit and other means for transportation. But the challenge is always, what do we do for the last mile? How do we get around the last mile between where we need to go and where we land? So there are a lot of things that engineers can bring to bear. I also say that, you know, on this, day that we celebrate engineering, I'm proud to say that I'm an engineer. Uh, engineers can always find a solution provided the challenge. So this is an opportunity for us to not only look behind and be grateful for all that we know and we have come to experience and enjoy, but also take this opportunity to figure out what is it that we can do to leave this planet for the future generations. So in that context, you know, take a look at the concepts put forth by the American Society of Civil Engineers called the Future World Vision. See what, what the research has shown us as to what can be done, what is possible. And the other thing that that tells us is we cannot be working in silos. And that's the unique about WFEO, it brings all engineers together because it takes a village to build the future. So we need everybody, including non-engineers to contribute to a very diverse, inclusive cities, communities, transportation systems, and whatever it may be to make this a better place for all of us and for the future generations. Appreciate the opportunity to be here for us, and I would be more than glad to engage in a conversation and expand more. But, you know, as we think about the future, think about, you know, being more creative, being innovative, come up with solutions. I know uh, people are now talking about how do you minimize pollutions? And I was talking to somebody yesterday, though they are there in India right now, looking to see you know, trying to make most of these two-wheeler two vehicles and other stuff more electric rather than based on uh, fossil fuel that's causing, you know, a lot of the pollutions and air quality issues. So 
we need to make sure that we improve the quality of life for everybody and leave no one behind. And, uh, you know, as I always like to conclude my presentation said, and I'm passionate and very optimistic about the future. And I think it is in good hands for us in all of your, what you do for the organization and for the future engineers and future leaders who are going to come behind us. Thank you and best wishes to all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Guna, for the valuable contribution and your presence today. You're always an added value wherever you are and uh, I'm happy that you've participated today. Thank you. Now, uh, we'll move on with uh, Dr. Madeleine Kanga, who was the president of WFEO between 2017 and 2019. And she was the 2013 nas national president in Engineers Australia. Uh, she's also a non-executive director of large organizations in Australia, working in the field of transport and utilities and in innovation. Uh, she has successfully led the proposal for the UNESCO to declare the 4th of March as a World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development. Uh, Dr. Marlene, I welcome you here. Thank you very much, uh, Firas. It's a real pleasure to be here and an honor in such a distinguished company uh, and a very interesting topic. Uh, on sustainable and smart cities uh, and is part of the celebrations for World Engineering Day 2023. Uh, I will share my screen uh, uh, with my presentation and I my presentation will uh, uh, present uh, information a little differently. I'm going to talk about what has actually been done uh, in, in as an example in, the, in Sydney in terms of implementing a resilient and sustainable city. And this uh, uh, case study that I'm going to present is based on my firsthand experience as uh, the chair of the Sydney Water Corporation Planning and Infrastructure Committee, which I've chaired uh, from 2017 to uh, 2023, at, at least uh, until this month. And, um, well, I've just finished nine years on the board of Sydney Water Corporation. And I'd like to talk about the, the strategies that have informed the development of this sustainable city. Um, so as, as, as some of you might know, um, engineering is, is really critical to advance uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And advancing these goals, as President Jose Vieira has said, is a key objective of WFEO. The UN Global Sustainable Development Report, which was published in 2019, identified science and engineering as a lever for uh, progressing sustainable development and sustainable cities as one of the pathways for sustainable development. So they identified, as you can see, six levers from human cap capabilities sustainable and just economies, energy decarbonization, food systems, urban and peri-urban development, and global environmental commons, and science and technology as one of the key levers. And smart cities are at that intersection of peri-urban and peri-urban developments and science and technology. So very important that we can advance sustainable development through smart cities. So brief introduction to Sydney Water Corporation, which is uh, Australia's largest water utility. It is a, a state-owned corporation, that is it is owned by the government of New South Wales. And it provides more than 500 billion liters of water to about 5.3 million people across greater Sydney and the Blue Mountains and Illawarra region. So current area of operation is shown in blue. And it, it where currently it is a water services supply authority. It will become the trunk drainage authority for the new Aerotropolis and the new second Sydney airport, which is under construction right now and due to be completed by 2025. So you see here 
an area which is mainly white. This is the area of expansion. And you can see it's like a 50% increase on the current uh, area of operations. This will result in some 3 million more people from 5 million to 8 million in the next 30 years, making this region one of the fastest growing in the developed world. And being a mainly greenfield site, it provides great opportunities to put in smart, sustainable technologies. And this expansion includes the new Western Sydney International Airport. The strategy for sustainable development has been informed by the Greater Sydney Commission vision of a metropolis of, metropolis of three cities. So similar to the hub and spoke model that has been talked about uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Nelson Ogun Shankan and uh, Guna, Dr. Gunavan, we have here three major hubs. The Harbour CBD, which is based close to the city and which is the oldest part of the city, some parts around 200 years old. Um, in the center, we have Greater Parramatta, which is centered around Parramatta River. And this is the limit to which the harbor extends. You can see the blue area, which is the river from the harbor area. Beyond this, there's no waterways. Sydney is known for its blue water uh, uh, vistas, but beyond this point, you don't see that. It's surrounded by mountains in what is basically a basin. And so here on, you see Western, uh, the Western Sydney Parkland City, which is shown in yellow, and the Western Sydney Airport you can see located there. This area in yellow is larger than Australia's third city of Adelaide. Uh, so you can imagine how, how large it is. And from north to south, it's, uh, it's about 100 kilometers. And east to west, it's about 30 kilometers. It's a huge area. So here we have the members of the board, including myself, uh, which led a strategy for sustainable development. Sydney Water is a signatory, one of the water utilities of the world that is a signatory to the UN Global Compact for Sustainable Development. It has set renewable energy and net zero targets to achieve net zero by 2040, if not earlier. It is focused on climate independent water supplies and water recycling. These words were not heard of when I first joined the board nine years ago and shows the transformation that has taken place in the thinking of the organization. Uh, it it uh, invests heavily and strategically in innovation and new technology, data and an analytics, and uh, it has a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion for a future capable workforce, including engagement with Australia's First Nation people. And as a responsible organization, focus on ethics and anti-corruption, uh, global reporting initiative for sustainability, and major projects, all major projects, are mapped against the UN Sustainable Development Goal. So here you see the once in a lifetime opportunity to develop a sustainable city in what is a mainly green field uh, uh, location. Some 30 billion is to be spent in the next 10 years by, by 2030, about one and a half billion per year. Uh, and at the moment, there are 100 projects worth more than 100 million on the go, of course, with different lifetimes for completion. Um, and this is an opportunity for water recycling, water reuse, reuse of waste, conversion to biomethane, and powering a circular economy. Once again, here you see. Uh, some of the award-winning uh, design that's been implemented to catch the stormwater, which is, you can see the spine of it has a, has a creek, uh, which is called South Creek. Uh, it runs north to south. And to use that as a basis for keeping this western part of the Sydney city green and cool, it is usually four degrees warmer than the eastern part of the city. Um, and some of the techniques that have been used, you can see here, is uh, permeable uh, pavements to absorb stormwater runoff so that trees can be planted, um, enabling a new green canopy. And, and uh, 
providing more open space, more recreation, and uh, Im improving opportunities for employment, so social and economic benefits. Uh, Sydney Water is also on the countdown to net zero, using wastewater sludge to create gas, uh, limiting waste byproducts. And uh, it also takes food waste from around the city and converts that also to biomethane. Uh, wastewater treatment plants are now called wastewater re resource recovery plants and are being expanded across the grid and will generate uh, uh, biogas uh, for use in, to generate electricity, which will power homes. And as I mentioned before, the target is to reach net zero by 2040. The heart of uh, Western Sydney development is the cir circular economy. A, a 1.1 billion advanced water recycling center has commenced construction. And this will treat 100 million liters of wastewater daily by 2036. So it's a potential re resource recovery hub for Western Parkland City and will take both domestic and agricultural organic waste and convert that to biomethane. It will also recycle water and that recycled water will be used by large industries and in and the Sydney airport as well. It's, it is located only 10 minutes from the new Western Sydney International Airport and will be at the heart of a circular economy. And here are some examples of the innovations being implemented. AI is being used to analyze uh, pipe conditions to forecast and predict uh, pipe failures. Um, and here we see a robot inspecting a large main. So, a large number of IoT devices have been deployed across critical mains in the city again to, to predict blockages and therefore envir reduce environmental discharges and protect the environment. Households also have a part to play and the smart home also is being tested out. And again, there's an opportunity to build these in Western Sydney. The purple pipe shows where the recycled water within a household can be recycled, uh, for example, from washing machine to toilets. And behind the meter technology will be used to enable households to manage their own water use. And of course, can also be used to manage energy use. Uh, very interestingly, many of these projects are funded through sustainable development bonds, where the interest rate adjust downwards by a couple of basis points if certain sustainable development targets are met and, and conversely upwards uh, if they're not met. And so this just uh, brings together the financing of these large projects with the sustainable development goals objective. And here you see four large projects that have been funded in this way. And here's one that has been completed. This used to be a concrete drain in the heart of the city, in the Harbour City side. It's now, you can see a beautiful little park, uh, pocket park uh, with, bio, uh, with wetlands, salt marsh areas, a few uh, birds and wildlife and recreational space and adds tremendous value to the community. This is a project that was funded by sustainable development uh, bonds. So in conclusion, cities of the future are the heart of sustainable development because they look at every one of the sustainable development goals to support people, the economy, services, the environment, and of course, the institutions. And we engineers are the ones that can make the difference. And finally, in conclusion, I want to say, 4th March every year, World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development. I hope everyone has a wonderful day and happy World Engineering Day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marlene, for the presentation, for the time, and for the continuous support of all the activities of the WFEO. Now uh, we'll move to Dr. Fadi Shaya. He's an architect, urbanist, researcher, and educator who works at the intersection of science and technology studies, design, and the built environment professions. He's an assistant professor at the University of Salford and has taught at the Manchester School of Architecture, Parsons Schools of Design, and the American University of Beirut. Uh, Dr. Shaya, you're welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, dear Firas. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with my esteemed colleagues here today and uh, on the occasion of the World Engineering Day. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm really, uh, um, you know, overwhelmed with all these brilliant presentations. And just to put things in context, my background is in architectural engineering, but I've also practiced as an urban planner and I've worked for a while with the uh, United Nations uh, Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. So uh, when I turned into academia, I think I brought with me that perspective, but I also brought with me uh, a little bit of a critical perspective of how we can look at technology. So uh, I hope you will uh, enjoy this presentation. So I will situate my contribution to this panel. Um, just sorry, let me... Yeah, sorry, I don't have slides, unlike what architects are usually expected to have, uh, but uh, yes, right. So I will situate my contribution to this panel within two parameters. First, as a direct response to the panel's topic on frontier technologies, or uh, I will call FTs. And second, relation relational to my present community of concern and field of impact as a practitioner turned educator which are my students and researchers of the built environment. I'm cautious with using, with using the word technology, let alone adding the frontier descriptor to it. Inspired by the work of philosopher Gilbert Simondon, I ask my students to differentiate the static notion of technology, i.e. the ensembles available to us at a given time, from the more dynamic and useful concept of techniques introduced by Simondon, which is the technical thought associated with specific energy eras. So Simonon defines the artisanal in the 18th century, thermodynamic in the 19th century, electrotechnics with the discovery of electricity in the early 20th century, nuclear in the mid 20th century, and last but not least, electrometallurgic in the late 20th century and ongoing uh, at this time. And electrometallurgic here refers to uh, the electricity fused with metals, which are the computer chips that we have right now. So take the following example. The smoke and smog of the 19th century uh, of uh, industrial Manchester, where I am uh, right now, can be understood as byproducts of what Simondon periodizes as the thermodynamic era. So this is where factory machines were concerned with efficiency and located close to the sources of energy from coal. In contrast, the techniques of 21st century digital representation of clouds, which is what we represent using uh, computers in architecture and engineering, uh, these are grounded in Simondon's electrometallurgic era, so the computers, where computational processing capacities of personal computers and data centers around the world rely on the thermal resistance, voltage regulation, and amplification of the silicon metal transistors. So Simondon has powerfully articulated that techniques or technical thought change relational to energy eras. And with it, the technical objects of that era where humans become potentials or potentialities that participate in the potentiality of the technical object. So, so the humans and the objects participate in each other. In that light, Simondon's philosophy grounds humans and technical objects in their environments and in each other. We can understand technical objects as technical beings whose mode of existence is ontologically equal to human and living beings where both come together in their associations with the environment. So we don't look at technology anymore as just an artifact, but we look at it as a being, just like the human being starts as a cell, emerges in a specific environment in the womb, and then comes out to the environment where the body is ready to breathe the air uh, outside of the mother's womb. So technical thought then becomes a framework to understand technical progress in relation to contemporary energy eras and as grounded in specific environments. And humans are not more in control of nature or the enslavers of machines, but rather the associates of technical objects. At the University of Salford, my colleagues and I are currently working with our postgraduates on translating the priority actions for the COP26 breakthrough agenda from a global master plan for accelerating decarbonization into situated urban and architectural strategies to revitalize the Manchester Ship Canal, once the most significant maritime infrastructure in the world, 
the artery of industrialization and a major profiteer from slavery back then. So we engage with two parallel threads, the archaeology of carbon, focusing on embodied and operational carbon, and how to ground contemporary technical thought to better understand the local community's welfares and revitalize the derelict, the derelict landscape of the canal. A key challenge in such work is localizing this global master plan to site-specific strategies, considering the scalar nature of regions and localities. And I would argue that the UN and international communities discourse prompt a significant part of this challenge about the human technology relationship, evident in the fervent hope for eradicating the human nature divide in the interest of humans. So I'll use a quotation here. Frontier technologies herald great hopes for humanity, says the UN DESA's World Economic and Social Survey 2018. Liu Jianmen, the Undersecretary General of Economic and Social Affairs and the head of DESA, affirms this grand statement and calls for our collective vision for a society without hunger, illiteracy, and disease where no one is left behind. Let us ask ourselves as engineers and professionals of the built environment, what is our reason for being, among other experts and professionals, in such a utopian society without hunger, illiteracy, and disease, let alone if such a society is possible? The obvious answer is that we have no reason for being if there are no problems, breakdowns, and developments. And as the late philosopher and social scientist Bruno Latour reminds us, for politics to be possible, for there should be no society, no social realm, and no social ties, but there exists translations between mediators that generate traceable associations. And that is what I'm arguing for today. So the idealist developmental discourse on technology highlights uh, an anthropocentric, so it's, it's, it's a focus centered on humans and a technocentric focused on technology, uh, which is really manifested in the idea of the frontier technologies, where humans control nature, take center stage in the cosmic relations, and hail technology as an absolute panacea. You can read such a discourse, uh, again, in the same UN DESA report, in questions like, uh, digital technologies, opportunities for catching up or falling behind. So it's always a black and white. And an Undersecretary General Jenmen's claim that technologies cannot on their own reach the people that need them the most, alluding to the role of national policies and international political will and cooperation. While it is understood that such discourses are meant to be high level, inspirational and hopeful, the major misconception that the techno that technologies need to reach the people that need them. So this is the quote from uh, uh, the undersecretary's uh, statement, technologies need to reach the people that need them. As if, as if they are artifacts distributed as a philanthropic handout. There needs to be consideration of how communities across the globe do not equally participate in technical thought, inhabit or do not equally inhabit various environments, or uh, are variably affected by the impacts of climate change and socioeconomic development. This is a topic that has been already addressed in science and technology studies uh, since the 80s and the 90s, and is best exemplified in different discussions about the site-specific socio-technical associations from mundane artifacts like keys, doors, seat belts, all the way to international aid through photoelectric lighting kits uh, and uh, rural water pumps, all the way to the electric vehicles starting in the 70s uh, and the tests with rapid uh, personal transit systems. So the SDG's faith in technology is overconfident but not misplaced. As always, the problem is in localization, reminding us of Latour's eminent question, how do we localize the global? I will share two more examples uh, of how such uh, idealist imaginaries of technology coupled with utopian aspirations do not provide a productive translation for our socio-technical world. I will briefly discuss the concerns for spatial practice as altered by COVID-19 and the concern for physical exchanges transformed by contactless transactions. The costly COVID-19 pandemic that swept the globe a few years ago forced billions to reconsider the everyday spatial conventions in cities. But before frontier technologies in biomedical engineering and biotechnology had any impact, the initial policy response was much more elemental. Physical distancing or spatial settings reminiscent of laboratories and wards. 
Architectural theorist and design sociologist Albena Yaneva eloquently documented and explained how this major breakdown forced the architecture profession to, re to rethink its tenets and reevaluate its, its epistemic practice, specifically at the intersection of architectural design with how science arranges space and generates social relations. So now science, uh, after COVID-19, is already informing us as architects and engineers on how uh, to design space standards. The insightfully, uh, she insightfully claims, so that's Professor Yaneva, she insightfully claims that mundane questions of spatiality and design shift the scholarly attention towards a more localist perspective on the making, meaning, and evaluation of architectural knowledge. Another example, homelessness is on the rise according to the UN Habitat, World Economic Forum, and the many local authorities around the world. The grim static, uh, statistic is from 100 million in 2005 to 150 million worldwide today. As a general observation, schools of architecture engage with concerns for rough sleepers and homeless and the homeless in one of two approaches hailed by frontier technologies, employing advanced materials and modular designs to help governments produce social housing or prescribing creative micro solutions for temporary shelters, shelter, shelters sorry, that homeless individuals can create on their own. But frontier technologies in advanced materials, additive, additive manufacturing and robotic fabrication do not address the elemental concerns of how publics, and by publics, I mean the general publics, not the public institutions, interface with the rough sleepers and the homeless on an everyday basis, which is giving cash as a material form of mediation and gift giving relational to people. With more people relying on contactless payments, and since COVID-19 instituted reduced physical exchanges, cash became a scarce resource resource for socializing. The response is not simply technological, but rather socio-technical collaborations between civil society, government, industry, and individuals, where technics is employed to its fullest potential. For example, the iZettel model in Sweden, it's an app uh, which was bought for $2.2 uh, $2 billion in 2018, provides a clip-on extension to mobile devices to accept contactless payments uh, if you compare it you, in the US, there's a similar invention called the Square, which is sold at 16 pounds uh, in UK, British pounds. Uh, but the idea is that the mobile phone becomes a payment terminal, which it is not at the, at the moment. With time, this might become an integrated part of the smartphone driven by commercial demand, but not the morality for saving rough sleepers. So what I'm saying here is that uh, these are also these kind of technologies uh, are driven by demand, and it's not only because uh, uh, we want to save the world and end homelessness. This is not the same as the token system, which is closer to charity cash, like the Billy Chip model in the UK. So to conclude, the challenges that await us are daunting, and that is what makes design and engineering such exciting socio-technical domains and future-looking professions. However, we must not lose sight that the agency of technical beings and human beings work or fail to work in alliance to produce the worlds we live in and aspire for. So maybe the concern that begs a platform with engineering and design is not about frontier technologies as, 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 as ready-made solutions in that sense, or as prescriptions and artifacts, but rather, what I'm calling or I'm borrowing from the literature on relationality, I'm using the word fuzzier because it's always fuzzy. It's never clear. So the fuzzier frontiers of techniques or technical thought as grounded relational and responsive associations among humans, machines, and environments. This is a more inclusive approach where communities are intelligent rather than smart. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fadi, for this uh, presentation and your talk. Uh, it's really appreciated that you have prepared uh, such a short paper on this. Thank you for the contribution. To uh, 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 Rahil, uh, you know that uh, uh, Rahil is coming from the uh, SPEED and he's pursuing his master's in computational science and engineering from the University of Rostock, Germany. 
He already completed his uh, B.Tech Mechanical Engineering from ITM Vocational University, India. At present, he is since 2016, uh, uh, or he is uh, Vice President of Finance and Industrial Relations in Speed and working with uh, Speed since 2016 and facilitated various regional students form, Indian students forms and global students form. Uh, Rahil, you're welcome to start your presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, can you hear me, everyone? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, I will share my screen. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, we see the the, the mm -hmm. world speed the homepage. Oh, nice. First off, thanks a lot, Firas, for my introduction. And thanks a lot for all the panelists. It was quite insightful presentation from all. And we first, I will share you about what the speed is. It's a student platform for engineering education development. It provides a platform to the engineering education uh, for the students to provide their ideas from all over the world, from all the universities, from all, from all the part of the world. And we uh, have annual conferences every year. Last year we had in Cape Town, South Africa, where from Global Engineering Dean Councils and everyone will come and we will provide our problems, solutions, everything. For more information, you can connect on our website and also, if you want any information, you can directly contact us on mail. And we are also on the social handles like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. The presentation which I am going to share is from the workshop which we have for the universities to provide the insight for the smart cities and like for the students. So let me know if you are able to see it. Hold on. I'll just, it's not a kind of a presentation. It's a different one. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yep. So, so this is a presentation for the work, workshops, which you provide in the universities to the students to provide the insight of less, like smart cities. So the students from different background can come up with ideas, innovations, not only from the mechanical, every departments. So first we'll go with the what is smart city. So it is a integration of technologies in the strategic approach for sustainable 21st century which has brought a new global trends of sustainable development by excelling in multiple complementing dimensions, like phenomenon, like the two important phenomena, if I say the urbanization, second is information communication technologies. If I say in, in information communication technology, it is a bridge between government and the citizens which, with, with the channel, they can interact with each other and they can develop the city from the feedback from the government so that is also a main component. <clears throat> so according to the current trends, why we need smart cities? Because of the uh, population, environment, quality, economic prosperity, and social well-being, like COVID also is there. So we have a mission to ensure a smart, effective infrastructure, transportation, energy. Like these are the three main uh, uh, components in which a smart cities can be ensured with effectively with our vision to provide a practical and efficient solution for the goal of smart cities. So I'll be describing about the three, uh, three key areas like the transportation, infrastructure and energy. First off infrastructure, the physical infrastructures are like roads, building, water treatment, waste management, waterways. So in that information communi uh, communication technology is like a key part, which bridges with the uh, citizens, as I said earlier, and also uh, it is a potential thing for the city 
by uh, by the by the feedback system you will get uh, the government also knows what we want to develop in the cities also on the local way they'll be able to connect with the government and more efficient way so the key requirements for infrastructures are like appropriate facilities safety from undesired accidents ability to withstand natural calamities and should have a proper transportation so first is transportation second effective traffic management excellent public transport connecting mobility and autonomous vehicle integrations with infrastructure energy for fruitful movements of good, goods and people so what are the three uh, what are the key transportations where we can have it to make a smart like common like availability cheap punctuality faster and efficient transport networks and comfortable that is key components for the logistics and transportations the third is energy where we can uh, provide by intelligent smart grid generation and also current trends are like sharing energy with each other is also a current trend where i can say to uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain are using these are the major necessities for energy to make a smart city like efficiency less carbon emissions should be renewable minimum vibration of harmful gases cheaper and low maintenance cost so in the smart cities like uh, if i say internet of things is the vein of our city uh, of of the city like which spreads all across the city and which connects the dots like every solutions you will be having from the uh, iot's and iot's are like the sensors uh, which are the hidden part behind the iot and which conveys the which converts the parameter of physical nature to the electronic and signal which can uh, be human or autonomous we systems can be solved this is smart infrastructures so currently we have seen like the earthquake in turkey so it happened like because of the poor infrastructures we have suffered a lot in that things so smart infrastructure should be in like in such a way we should have a smart quick response systems with the natural calamities also with man made calamities and also it has a, because of the consumption and everything it uh, it has a, like lots of aspects and developments which you can work like geospatial technologies and everything and also the smart energy like grids that i already had discussed about communication and power the transmissions the solar energies and power distribution system and also the key part after it is like community engagement that is itc the technologies to enable community services housing recreations emer uh, emergency management urban plannings many include social studies on interaction of people with urban environments etc and thanks a lot thank you rahil uh, for your presentation and for the contribution of speed and the different activities that we're uh, carrying together with the young engineers future leaders committee uh, let me let me thank everyone uh, for attending today and uh, for participating in this very interesting webinar uh, i i would really thank uh, dr nelson and fedek for their participation Uh, also mr mazani from urtp i'm sorry for this inconvenience we'll make sure that this uh, video will be posted also on our social network and website and uh, everyone offline will manage to attend this uh, video as as the webinar uh, i would like also to to thank uh, president uh, viera for his support also dr malen for her continuous support and dr guna and uh, the participation of uh, our colleagues dr fadi shaya and uh, mr rahil from speed i thank you very much for your uh, attendance for your presentations and for the time uh, uh, for the time you've given to this uh, webinar and one final note i would like to say that engineers are the one uh, who bring technology to make our lives simpler they bring comfort and they bring the ease and access for today uh, i would like to uh, wish all engineers a very happy world engineering day 2023
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Firas. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you, Firas. See you soon. See you next week. See you. We we all belong to a great profession. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.